So I, I decided, I'm talking about single pill combinations, and rather than telling you what to do, I decided I would tell you how to think. Um, so the specific title that I was uh, given was First Line Drug Management of Hypertension, Role uh, of Single Pill Combinations. And I guess the, the argument that I want to uh, potentially have underlying my talk is that less choice may actually provide for better medicine uh, in general. Um, so uh, these are my uh, disclosures. Um, uh, I've done a number of, of things with a number of companies that make blood pressure lowering products. But I don't, I actually, this is a relatively non-product uh, based talk, so I, I, you don't have to be too suspicious of me. Um, what I'm going to do, hopefully, is describe some limitations of the way we currently do drug therapy for hypertension and cardiovascular risk reduction. And I'm going to frame this around the concepts of therapeutic inertia and therapeutic turbulence. How, how many of you have heard of um, therapeutic inertia? How many of you have heard of ther therapeutic turbulence? Okay, fair enough. So, okay. so um, and then I'm going to describe some potential advantages of single pill combinations um, that we can talk about. So, so the issue is really one of complexity. So I want you to think about this case for a minute. A uh, 60-year-old uh, construction worker who comes in for an annual checkup. Um, it, he's new to you because uh, uh, the last time he was in was about six years ago. Um, and at that time, his uh, fasting blood sugars were elevated, so he was told that he had some diabetes. Um, his recent glycated hemoglobin is 8%. His BMI is 31. His blood pressure is high at 164 over 88. Um, if you do ABIs, it was slightly low. Uh, his lipid profile is there before you, and he smokes, like all construction workers. <clears throat> so he has a conversation with you. He says, so, Doc, I'm pretty good, eh? Um, and he says, you know, with the economics the way it is, I need to work for another 30 years, maybe just another 20 years now that the Liberals are in power. Um, <laughs> can, you, uh, can you make this happen for me? Uh, so what are my chances? I I'm pretty good, right? Uh, do I need a pill? So uh, you think about his case for a second and you say, well, let's see. If you're already doing all the lifestyle stuff well, then we might give you metformin, maybe a second drug for your diabetes. We're, you're probably, with that blood pressure, if that's kind of a sustained blood pressure level, you're probably going to need at least three pills for your blood pressure. You probably need at least one drug for your lipids. Maybe, you know, we could give you a second one. Uh, you probably need to quit smoking, so we need to talk about that. There might be some drug therapy involved in that, maybe some aspirin, maybe not. So, so the reality is that this guy needs somewhere between seven to ten drugs. Uh, and so uh, that's an interesting thing to think about for this guy. So uh, at this point in the, um, in the clinical encounter with this guy, you know, you've got sort of a waiting room full of, full of people uh, now, uh, time's up. Uh, do you provide him a prescription uh, for 10 medications, full dose, follow up in one year? That's one option. Do you, and now if you're a specialist, do you, so are there any specialists? So we have the, the distinct advantage of being able to say, you know, that's a really great question. I think you should probably go talk to your GP about that. <laughs> uh, and you can just sort of leave it at that. Uh, you could start with a half a dose of the first medication and then plan to see him every two weeks for the next 21, 21 well, basically it's a whole year it'll be by the time you're done, sort of slowly up titrating the, the drugs and watching for side effects. Um, what do you start with? Uh, in this guy, what is most important? Do you start with the blood pressure meds? Do you start with the diabetes meds, the lipid meds? Uh, what? What's most important? So, uh, and then of course there is that question in the back of your mind, you know, why do I bother? I should just go home, you know, <laughs> he's not going to do anything anyways. But, it, you know, if you think about the, the actual sort of the, the real question, so, so uh, the question here is, um, how many decisions do you have to make in the next 30 seconds? Uh, and you can look at this a number of different ways, but I mean, so, so we've at Shep tried to be nice to you and we've said, you know what, you don't have to make too many, too many decisions. It's, it's actually fairly simple, right? You've got, uh, for blood pressure anyways, uh, I don't know about those other guys, but you know, just pick one of the five main classes of drugs and, and give it to them. 
the trouble is that the decision making for this guy looks more like this diagram, right? So there are seven drugs to, we're, we're just gonna use seven here, not 10. But there's seven of them here. So, you know, what's, should I start with A, or should I start with B, C, what do I start with, what do I give next? If you actually do the math for this, and this is a very conservative estimate, right? Um, there are 250 trillion ways of giving this guy seven drugs. So how are you in the next, now you only have 10 seconds, 10 seconds going to pick which option amongst those 250 trillion that you have to give this guy, right? That's the, that's the life that you guys live uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. And I think that this is a barrier to optimal therapeutics. And so, um, and, and we know that if you give people too many options, uh, it, it develops uh, something, it's one of the causes of therapeutic inertia. So this is a study uh, um, that was done a little while ago where they looked at, and an, an episode of therapeutic inertia is that you have this guy in your office and you throw up your hands and say, you know what, we're not doing anything, just like come back next week and hopefully your blood pressure is better. Um, in this study, they looked at, at people, uh, they divided people according to how many episodes of inertia they were having in their practice, and then they looked at blood pressure control rates. So if you were in the lowest quartile of therapeutic inertia, during the course of this study, the control rate went from about 50%, and actually just the fact that you had low inertia, you were willing to sort of work hard and up-titrate drug therapy, just knowing that somebody was watching you resulted in an increase in, in uh, blood pressure control rates amongst your patients. Uh, that was quite dramatic. If you were in the lo lowest core or the highest quartile for inertia, so that it didn't matter what the patient came in with, you were not gonna budge on, on giving them another blood pressure pill, then the control rate was started off low and it actually got worse. So I don't know, like, you know, these guys are ticking me off that doing this study, I, I'm gonna, like, not treat anybody. But, but there is this issue of inertia. And, and I think that complexity is often the reason that we don't react when we could. So, um, so I think the, the option of giving 10 drugs kind of uh, uh, right up front is probably not, um, not the best. But he, here's another reason uh, that uh, you may not want to do that first option. Not only is it hard for you to pick which option you want to give them, but it's hard on the patient. And if you give a lot, of, a lot of options, either in terms of the number of doses per day that the patient has to take, or just the, the, the number of pills in their hand when they have to swallow them, uh, we know that uh, adherence or persistence with therapy goes down. And so this is an argument for saying when you are starting drug therapy, you need to pick what you think is the most important option. You need to tell the patient why, and then you need to get them going with the most important pills up front. Because if you give them all 10, and you know, I mean, my example that I like to use with people is uh, if you have a patient on, for example, warfarin uh, for either stroke prevention or a, you know, VTE prevention, and you, it, you know, that drug lowers risk tremendously, and then you start them on five or six other drugs that each have a very, very modest effect on, on their longevity and their compliance with the warfarin decreases because their pill-taking cocktail has gotten more complicated, you could actually produce a stroke or kill the patient by making their drug cocktail too complicated. So I don't think that, that just giving all 10 meds and saying, you know, come back in here, we'll chat. Um, what about the other option, which is to sort of see the patient repeatedly? So this is hard on their wallet from a parking perspective, depending if you're in Toronto anyways. Uh, maybe other places it's less so, but, but there are other issues. And, and the concept here to think about is turbulence. So um, this was an interesting study looking at the number of medication changes 